dark of night before the dawn my soul be not afraid for the promised morning oh how long oh God of Jacob be my strength we will feast in the house to be here with you all. See some faces home from college for the holidays. This is wonderful. Well, our call to worship comes from Psalm 32, 6a and Psalm 116. I set it up this week uh, where I'm going to begin the verse, then y'all are going to participate by responding with the highlighted text. All right, so let's do this. The first part is, Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. I love the Lord because he hears my voice, my supplications, because he has inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I shall call upon him as long as I live. Let's pray. Father, you have displayed your glory in creation and through your word. And not only do you speak, but you hear. You especially incline your ear to your adopted children. You hear our words of thankfulness, our questions, struggles, needs, and our cries for help. What a glorious journey, what a glorious relationship. We get to explore and discover this world with the one who created it and is redeeming it through the proclamation of and faith in Jesus Christ. And we have the benefit of coming alongside one another and in a community while inviting others through the power of your Holy Spirit. May we appreciate these glorious realities more and more, and may we start now by worshiping you through songs of praise. Amen. Yes, let's encourage each other this morning by singing about the boundless love of our great God and Savior. Please stand. Sing out, here we go. Magnificent, marvelous, matchless love, too vast and astounding to tell. Forever existing in a world above, now offered and given to all. O fountain of beauty eternal, the Father, the Spirit, the Son, sufficient and endlessly generous, magnificent, marvelous, matchless love. Creation is brimming with thankfulness, the mountains exultant they stand. 
seasons rejoice in your faithfulness all life is sustained by your hand you crown every meadow with color you paint every shade in the sky they say the dawn wakes as an encore of magnificent marvelous passion love how great how great In the 
scripture reading this morning comes from Hebrews chapter 3. Our author has been emphasizing the superiority of Christ and he continues uh, to do that in this passage by showing that Christ is superior to Moses. Moses uh, was a faithful servant of, of God, of the house of God, but Jesus is far much more. He is the builder of the house of God and is worthy of, of far more glory. And because this is true, the author will once again ex exhort his readers to not fall away from Christ, but to stand fast. And he will uh, then conclude this passage by quoting Psalm 95 uh, as an illustration of Israel and their hardness of heart, um, not listening to God and, and not entering his rest. And then he will expand upon that for the, for the next uh, couple of chapters. So uh, follow along as I read uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. He was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was in all his house. For he has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, by just so much as the builder of the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken later. But Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are, if we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope, firm until the end. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit, just as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with this generation and said, they always go astray in their heart and they did not know my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Christ, that he is 
the apostle and the high priest of our confession, who is worthy of all glory and who has mercifully secured our salvation. We thank you that we can rest in him and that we are not required to atone for our own sins that, uh, and somehow justify ourselves before you. But Lord, we do confess that our faith does waver at times and we are guilty of hardening our hearts against the truth. We, we have everything that we need in order to believe and yet we sometimes expect or demand more. So Lord, help us to be humble and to believe the truth that you have revealed in and through your perfect Son and through your perfect Word. Give us perseverance. Help us to endure and to hold fast to our confession, recognizing that Christ is our only hope. And as we enjoy the privilege of hearing the truth proclaimed again this morning, we pray that you would soften our hearts. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear so that we might respond in humble faith and repentance. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You know, as I think through and meditate and reread and listen to Paul preach on Romans 9 through 11, one of the principles I keep pulling back is just the humility and gratitude of God's benevolent sovereignty in saving me. Let's stand together and, and proclaim that in just great awe as Isaac Watts so, so appropriately put this for us. season have you ever ever watched a sporting event for a team that you cared about after the fact on recording and you already knew the outcome and the outcome was that your team won but you watched it anyway um, when bad things happen 
when maybe they get way behind or they turn the ball over or do other things, you don't watch it wondering if that ultimately is going to lead to defeat and wondering how it's going to work out. You actually watch it with an anticipation of how in the world are they going to overcome that to come through in victory. The Christian life is very similar in a lot of ways. We approach the things that happen to us, I hope, we should with the eager anticipation and watching carefully in amazement at how God is going to force that for his glory and our good. We're going to sing a line even in this next song that I love that says, I know my pain will not be wasted. Christ completes his work in me. And that's another thing you get from what we're reading is that God completes his work. He follows through on all of his promises. Please pray with me. Our Father, we, we want to give you thanks and praise today in a week that everyone in our nation is thinking about Thanksgiving, and rightly so. Let us not forget who we are to be most thankful for and for all that you've done in our lives. Uh, we need to recognize that. We need to be grateful for our great God who, who gives us much. All good gifts come from you, O oh Lord. And and we know that there are those among us who are suffering, those that never have a day that <clears throat> they feel good. Um, but we, we give you thanks that in the midst of the suffering, there's grace and there's comfort so that they can comfort others in their, in their struggles. And we know that those 
or among, there are people here among us that are weighed down with sin and they're fighting. And God, we give you thanks that you give us grace and that you have mercy on us. And most of all, we, we do, of course, give you thanks for Christ who you know, has died for us and has made all these things possible. And we give you praise for keeping your promises. As we see in our text today, it's again, Romans 9 through 11, we see again and again the emphasis on the fact that you are God who keeps his promises. And it may take hundreds or thousands of years sometimes, but we know that you will make good on them. We know that you are sovereign, and we give you praise for that, that you have not just made promises, but you are powerful enough to sustain them and to keep them. And we have confidence in that. So, so God, we do we give you all the praise uh, for this church service, and we give you thanks. And help, just help us as a church be mindful as we think about Thanksgiving this week that we are mostly thankful for you. And we pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. Good morning. There we are. So good to see you, beloved. Uh, we are studying Romans Together, we are at Romans chapter 11. I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles, and if you would, find your way to Romans chapter 11. If you don't have a Bible with you, there's probably somebody close to you that does. You want to look on with them as we are working through this. We've been uh, studying this great book together for a while, and Romans 9 through 11 is a section of this that really goes together. And this morning, we come to Romans chapter 11, and I want to uh, focus in on our time here in the first 10 verses of chapter 11. I'm going to read, and if you would follow along in your Bibles, and then we'll uh, try to understand this text and, and see what the Lord has for us here. Paul says, I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be. For I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah? How he pleads with God against Israel. Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have torn down your altars and I alone am left and they are seeking my life. But what is the divine response? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. In the, name, in the same way, there has also come to be at this present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. What then? What Israel is seeking, it is not obtained. But those who were chosen obtained it. And the rest were hardened, just as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not and ears to hear not, down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened to see not and bend their backs forever. What an amazing passage. I, I was reading recently about how wonderful water is. No, actually I was, um, as you can tell, I'm an expert on Japanese art history. And I was reading uh, about a, a Japanese art form that's new to me. I had never heard of this, and, it's, and, and I'll butcher how it's pronounced, but it's in one word, epitsuryu. In Epitsuryu, it, it's literally painting a dragon in one single brush stroke. It's really fascinating. There's videos of this that you can go and see like there is for everything. Uh, but it's just, the artist takes a brush, loads it with multi, a multitude of paint and even different colors, and in one brush stroke, not only creates a dragon, but creates the scales and the spine and all of that with just one brush stroke. It's, it's an amazing, beautiful thing. A detailed, unbroken picture. And by varying pressure and brush position, it's explained this way. Never lifting from the page, the paint wash takes form with amazing detail. Carefr carefully, the artist moves his hand, snaking around to form the twisting body of the dragon. 
It's a skill that takes incredible precision and patience. The large brush slowly traverses the canvas, making gentle twists and turns, never once being lifted up until the body is complete. Boys and girls, you may have tried to do something like that. You ever try to make an entire picture without raising your pen or your pencil off the paper? You try to do the whole thing in one. Well, it's similar to that, but they do this with paint, and, and it's just one long thing, and it's amazing. What's amazing is that it's one brush stroke, one body, and yet rich detail is still preserved. And this is how the redemptive story, the storyline of the Bible works. There are many details, there are twists and turns, there are nuances, but it's all one unbroken picture performed by the single masterful brush stroke of the grand artist. Our interpretation of scripture demands that we pay attention to the details. It demands that we not just run over it too quickly and say, maybe like the artist, there's a dragon. But notice about it. Notice something about its scales and its spine and its twists and its turns. And notice how it tells a story. And the Bible is that way. Notice the details. Our interpretation of scripture demands that we take Israel Seriously, you have to. If you begin to read scripture, you do not get out of the book of Genesis before this nation seemingly comes out of nowhere. It is birthed through the lineage of Abraham and by the end of Genesis, uh, there are a multitude of sons and to each one there is a promise and they are divided up into tribes and we are off to the races. And then you get to the New Testament and you, and you find out that the promised Messiah is born to one of those specific tribes in fulfillment of the promise made to that tribe and not only that that the old testament king in israel came from one of those tribes and how all of that works together and it's it's all telling a story about this nation there's incredible detail there there are prophets that spoke directly to the nation in its various forms sometimes to the northern tribes sometimes to the southern tribes and sometimes to the enemies of those tribes but it's all centered around again that nation You have the Psalms, the Psalter, and and this is the the hymn book, the praise book of the nation from its leaders, how the people were to sing unto the Lord. You have the wisdom of God and the wisdom portions of the Old Testament, how the people were to walk in light of the glory of God and how they could navigate living a, a life that is holy and pleasing to the Lord with wisdom. In light, of the, the, in light of the fall of Genesis 3, uh, can we still know what is right before God? Can, can we still pursue wisdom? Can we still be wise in the sight of the Lord? Proverbs answers that question. Uh, can we still live the good life in, in light of the fall? Ecclesiastes answers that question. Can even at the very personal level of the relationship between a man and a woman, in light of the fall, can that too be done in a way that is honoring to the Lord? The Song of Solomon answers that question. But it all answers these questions of praise and specifics of wisdom and relationships in relationship to this nation, Israel. And we have to take Israel seriously. Barry Horner, who has done a lot of research in this, he says, Romans 11 is the crucial passage with regard to the New Testament teaching concerning the present nature and destiny of national Israel. This is the text. This is the chapter. Well, the question is why? Why should we take Israel seriously? You might be thinking, and many of us probably are, as we just sang here just a moment ago, the pressures of this day, the trials of this life, the pains in my body, in my family, they are weighing me down. Why should I care about this? Why should I care about taking Israel seriously? Because, and I want you to go back to this. I've referenced this a number of times. Look back at the end of chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, the very end there, we have a marvelous promise about our eternal security in Christ. Everyone who is in Christ, who is saved by him, who is bought by the precious blood of Christ, who has their sins washed away, who has the forgiveness of Christ, been granted forgiveness, you're now under the blood of Christ, the death of Christ, you have been also raised with him, you are so identified with him, even though we are sons and daughters of Adam and Eve, we are now identified with Christ, no longer with Adam. And he says something amazing here at the end of Romans 8, verse 38, I am convinced 
that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Isn't that marvelous? That is a glorious promise. I don't know about you, but as I read through that list, it sure seems, at least from my perspective, there are many things that are trying to separate us from God's faithful love. It doesn't mean that the battle goes away. It doesn't mean that there are not things in the heart and things in our life and in our families that are still struggles because we are not what we shall become ultimately. We still struggle in this life, even with things that we don't see or fully understand. So how can we believe this as we can clearly see and here's the question, Jews as a whole are not responding to the gospel. This raises a question at the end of Romans 8, how can we say this, what we just read at the end of Romans 8, if that doesn't seem to be the case for this nation that has been in play since Genesis? It seems they've rejected God. Has God rejected Israel? If he has, how can we ever read the Old Testament with any seriousness? If God has rejected Israel, how can we suppose, and here's, here's a very personal question, if God has rejected Israel, then, then what's to say he cannot also reject us? There's some Christians who say, well, he has rejected Israel. That, that creates a massive problem, not only for your theology, but for how you understand your relationship to God. How can we believe this? John Piper says it this way. He says, summarizing these three chapters, Romans 9 through 11, the main point which Romans 9 through 11 was written to prove, a view, Israel, a view of Israel's unbelief and rejection. What is at stake ultimately in these chapters is not the fate of Israel, that is penultimate. Ultimately, and here's what he says, God's own trustworthiness is at stake. And if God's word of promise cannot be trusted to stand forever, then all our faith is in vain. If God does not fulfill the, the hundreds, the myriad of, pro, uh, of promises made to Israel all over the Old Testament, then what's to say that he will fulfill his promises to us? Are we different? Is, is our faith of a different quality? Is it in a different person? No, it's all, even though we're on this side of the cross, it's still faith in the same person. Theirs in prospect, ours in retrospect, looking back at the cross. To answer this question, Paul takes us through three chapters, 9, 10, and 11, to prove this central point. And his point is that no, God has not rejected Israel, nor have any of God's plans failed. It's really good news for us. His argument so far is this, and just a very quick review here. We've, we've spent a lot of time here, but just to, to see this together. In Romans 9 verses 1 through 5, he, he rehearses the privileges and what God has given. And then in verses 6 through 20, 24, all whom God has elected to salvation are or will be saved. That's the point of those verses. All whom God has chosen, whom God has elected to salvation are or they will be saved. What determines salvation in every single case is the electing grace of God in Christ. Paul says you have to start there. As you start to understand this, <clears throat> this great subject, you have to understand that it's God who saves. Our contribution to our salvation is sin, and it's God who saves, and he elects us by his grace. That is the point of those verses. Then we see in chapters, uh, chapter 9, verses 25 through 29, that God has previously revealed that not all Israel will be saved and that some Gentiles would be. He's already shown this, and he demonstrates that in those verses. And Paul says, in effect there, just read Isaiah, just read Hosea, and you'll see that, that not everybody who is a Jew outwardly, th that does not mean that they are truly a believer in the Messiah, Christ. And then we saw in chapters 9, verse 30, all the way through the very end of chapter 10, the reason, the failure, so to speak, of the Jews is because of unbelief. Why are there some who are not in the Lord? It's because of unbelief. They stumbled over Jesus. The very Messiah that is promised in Genesis 3 to Eve. 
The very Messiah that is promised to come and rule in his kingdom with his scepter from the tribe of Judah. That's Genesis 49. That's really early. The very Messiah that is promised to come and sit on the throne of David. The very Messiah that is, that is promised, and he says that he will give his life as an atonement for sin, Isaiah 53. The very Messiah that says in that atonement he will ratify a new covenant that will not be like the old covenant, and he will, have, and he will grant forgiveness of sins and the indwelling of his spirit. That very Messiah, that very Messiah that was promised and anticipated has been rejected in unbelief. They have, in a very literal sense, taken the name of the Lord, Yahweh, in vain. By the way, do you know what that means? In Exodus 20, verse 7, the Ten Commandments are there, a summary of the law. It says, in Exodus 20, verse 7, you shall not take the name of your Lord, Yahweh, in vain. Do you know what that means? Do you you think that the Lord, through Moses, had movies and music in mind when he was writing? Well, that may be an ultimate outworking of that where we hear someone use the name of the Lord in a way that is not pleasing, in a way that is not honoring to God. That's one sense of that, but that's actually not what was meant by that passage. In Exodus 20, verse 7, when it says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, is talking about wearing. Literally, you shall not wear it in a vain way. Here's what was happening. They wore the clothes of God's people, but their hearts were cloaked in unbelief. Outwardly, they they bore the marks. Literally, even the the mark of circumcision on on the flesh of some, they, they they wore the marks, they wore the clothing, literally at times, in their priestly garments and, and all the things that God had appointed for them, yet their hearts were far from the Lord. That was taking the Lord's name in vain. Romans 9, here's another way to think about this, is really highlighting Israel's past, what happened. Romans 10, as we've seen the last number of weeks, is Israel's present. But this leads us to a question, what about Israel's future? What's going to happen? How is God going to resolve all of this? How does this problem of Israel's unbelief get resolved? Well, this is the answer of chapter 11. We may summarize it this way. God's love for his people can be seen even now, verses 1 through 10, in spite of Israel's failure. Uh, Their failure is neither total nor final. God has not rejected Israel, Paul says a couple of times here. Israel has not been canceled. We live in a cancel culture, right? Uh, you, You see this happening all the time where someone will say something in the words of the Proverbs that is stupid, right? Something that is foolish, something that should never be uttered, something that should probably not even be thought, and yet they will say something or they will do something, and then they are canceled by the culture. They are seen as irredeemable. They are seen as, uh, as a cast out. Some have viewed Israel that way because they have done things, they have uttered things. Have you not read what they have done and what they have said in the Old Testament? Have you seen the false worship that they have rendered to other gods? Have you seen the perversions that have taken place? They, they, have they been canceled? Have you heard the things that they have said? This is our God. See this golden calf? This is our God. This is the one who has rescued us. This is our God. See the Ashtaroth, Baal, and, and, and Nebo, and, and, and so on. It's grotesque. It's awful. It's perverse. Some have reasoned, therefore, God has canceled them. God has thrown them out. He has cast them out forever. And now he is moving on to a a new people. We'll call it the church. If ever an opportunity presented itself for Paul to renounce unbelieving Israel once and for all, it would be right here. Right here. I want, I want us to think about this question. How can we see the love and purposes of God, not only for them, but for us? What, what are some proofs that God has not rejected his people? And again, remember, this is tied to your salvation too at the end of Romans 8. Proof number one, God is demonstrating his personal saving grace. 
Here's one way you know that God has not cast off Israel. He's still saving people out of Israel. He's been doing this. He's always been doing this. Verse one, look at it again. Paul says, I say then, God's not rejected his people, has he? This is an implied uh, question and that he answers with a very obvious answer. May it never be. Strongest possible words he could use here. Absolutely not. Heaven forbid. Perish the thought. Paul, how do you know this? Look at me, Paul says. I'm the proof. I'm an Israelite. I'm a descendant of Abraham. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. Look at me. If God has moved on from Israel, then how do you explain me? Paul says, what am I doing here? I'm amazed, as I've been reading a lot on this, how some theologians read these words, God has not rejected his people in verse one, and they immediately try to prove the very opposite. You're reading what I'm reading, right? Has God rejected his people? May it never be. It's pretty obvious. You have to go through some very interesting, very unusual twists and turns to even make that say something else. Paul is starting with himself, his own personal testimony. I am proof that God is saving Israelites even now, he says. He's also, note carefully in verse one, he's also proof that God's saving election is not merely corporate, but it's individual. It's not that God has just chosen Jacob, uh, that he's just chosen the, the, the nation. He has chosen individuals within that nation. That is the point of electing grace, as we're gonna see later on in the chapter. This is not just a corporate statement about election. This is a individual thing where God is saving people. God doesn't just save the church, Right? He saved people and he's called you and me. He's called us out of this world and into the kingdom of his son and and he saved us as individuals and then collectively and corporately we make up the church, those who are the called out ones. That's what Paul is saying. He's proof that God's saving election is not merely corporate, it's individual. He he says, I'm an Israelite. He says this a few different ways. I'm an Israelite. He's saying, I'm a member of the nation. If you're gonna say anything about God being done with Israel, then you're gonna have to explain this to me because I'm an Israelite. Not only that, I'm a descendant of Abraham. I am a physical blood descendant of Abraham. I am of God's people. I am of that stock. I am of that ethnicity, Paul says. You're going to tell me he's done with us? Not only that, narrowing this down. So he starts at the most widest angle, an Israelite, uh, and, and then from, the, from uh, a descendant of Abraham, getting into the blood aspect of that, the tribal aspects, and then further the tribal aspects, I am of the tribe of Benjamin. It's a very significant statement. Some of you here might be of the tribe of Benjamin or the tribe of Paul. Or the tribe of Joshua. Have you ever thought our, our staff elders, it sounds like a, an Old Testament <laughs> honor roll or something. I like to think of it as an honor roll. Um, but the tribe of Benjamin, that's actually a very significant statement here. Because after Solomon's death, the tribes become divided, the 12 tribes of Israel. And the southern kingdom was Judah, and then there was a very small tribe within Judah called Benjamin. And it was an honored tribe. It it was a a a preferred tribe in a lot of ways. The first king of Israel, Saul, came from this tribe. In fact, Paul's Jewish name is Saul. He was named after the king of Israel who came from the tribe of Benjamin. Jonathan's from this tribe, David's uh, best friend. I would even argue that Esther and Mordecai are from this tribe. It's the tribe that gave us all of these. It was an honored tribe. This was a well-known name. This was one name, one tribe that you did not speak ill of. It's honored. As Paul's writing this, he knew that this was one of the few tribes left in his day that could actually trace their ancestry all the way back because they were from the southern tribes who returned after the Babylonian exile. So what is he saying here? Paul is saying, I'm a demonstration of God's personal saving grace. Let's just start here at a very personal note. I am a demonstration of God's 
personal saving grace. In fact, that is the word that Paul uses. You don't need to turn there, but there's a number of places. Philippians is one, 1 Timothy 3, or 1 Timothy 1 is another, where Paul gives his testimony, and he talks about how God's grace overcame his, his unbelief and his disobedience, and he uses that word demonstration in 1 Timothy 1, verses 13 and following. L- listen to what he says. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, Yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement. Write this down, he says, deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. I am the chief of sinners from his perspective. And yet for this reason, I found mercy so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ, listen, might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. That's for us. Can God save me? Look at the life of the Apostle Paul. Can can God's salvation, even though it was a long time ago, maybe experientially in your life, the, f- the freshness of that, the joy of that. Just look to the Apostle Paul here at the end of his life saying, I'm still mindful how Christ demonstrated his patience in my life and showing me grace and mercy. He was living proof that God was not done with Israel. He was possibly, from his own vantage point, the greatest Christ-rejecting, Jewish gospel-hating person who ever lived. Was there a greater enemy of the gospel and of the Messiah immediately after the resurrection of Jesus? If there is one, I don't know who it is. It was the Apostle Paul, and God showed grace to him and mercy, and God saved him. It's as if somebody somewhere was having a a thought in their heart, or maybe between two early Christian brothers in the first century, and they were like, yeah, God's grace is really awesome, but man, there's just no way he can save some people. And God said, in effect, watch this. Who's the greatest enemy of the church? The greatest. Think about this. Don't answer this out loud, but but who's the greatest enemy of our nation? And you're gonna get different answers on a national level. Uh, Maybe who's the the, the greatest enemy that we cannot even begin to imagine because this person, not only in their national affections, but their religious affections and and the beliefs and the unbelief of their own heart are so far removed from the gospel. In Christ. There's just no way God could save them. That's exactly what he did with Paul. To prove the point. And to show a demonstration of his perfect patience as an example to those who would believe. God saved him. Here's the point here. If if God rejected the nation Israel because they rejected him, then how do you explain me, Paul says? If he saved the greatest gospel rejecter, listen, good news, then he can save anyone. Some of you might even think there's no way God could show mercy on me. You laugh at the gospel, you ridicule the gospel, you, you think this is foolish, this is just, just people talking about some mythical being. You, you think there's no way he could save me. Look to the life of the Apostle Paul, the greatest gospel rejecter of all time. This is proof number one. Proof number two God is saving a present remnant. God is saving a present remnant. This is in verses two through six. Look at verse two again. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Again, just let the text speak. Let it rest on what it's saying here, what Paul is saying. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Don't try to make that into something else. Or do you not know what the scripture says? And here he goes back to some Old Testament texts, starting with Elijah and how Elijah pled with God against Israel. Listen to verse two. God has not rejected his people. Why? He says in verse two, because he foreknew them. 
foreknew them. What, what does that mean? Some people have wrongly explained foreknowledge in this way, that God looks down through time and he sees what man and women will do in response to his grace and then he waits for them, they respond, and then he makes a choice based on that. And so election kind of works backwards. That, that's nowhere found in scripture, actually. And that's actually not what the word itself means here. It, it means that God knew them before. It's not talking about God basing a, a prior decision based on someone's later decision. It's saying this, that before they even made a decision, before they even took a breath, God knew them and he set his love and affections on them and he chose them. He knew them before. Before what? The prefix for tells us that God's choice of Israel took place before any action or status on the part of Israel that might have qualified her for God's choice. We know that because the Old Testament tells us that. Why did God love Israel? It's not because you were a great nation, the Lord says. You were the smallest of the nations. It's not because you were an obedient nation. You were disobedient. It's not because you were great. It's not because you were mighty. It's because I loved you and I set my affections on you. He planned it. He purposed it. He, he made it happen. Now, in order to demonstrate a very important truth, Paul takes us back through a, an interesting window into Jewish history here. He assumes, if you look carefully at verse 2, he assumes his readers are familiar with the story of Elijah. Are you familiar with this story? Jared Pratico preached this story, 1 Kings 8, to us uh, a, a while back. Was that earlier in the summer? I think it was 1 Kings 18 and 19. He assumes his readers are familiar with this story. And the story is where Elijah pleaded with God against Israel. He says here, are you familiar with this? Do you not know what the scripture says? And then what follows in verse 3 is a quote from 1 Kings 19 verse 10. And, and this now, beginning in verse 3 in our text, is Elijah speaking. Romans 11 verse 3. Elijah's talking. Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have torn down the, your altars, and I alone am left. They are seeking my life. Elijah is a really important prophet in Jewish history. He may be at the head of the prophetic line. But what's being described here, and this was true as you read about it in 1 Kings, 1 Kings and 2 Kings, really the, uh, the story of the, the fracture of the kingdom after Solomon and all that came in its wake. It's a really dark time. How dark? Baal is the God of the hour for Israel. They are not worshiping Yahweh. King after king is disappointing, uh, disappointing the people and not leading them as a faithful king and as a faithful leader for the nation, and there's a darkness over the nation. At this point, as, as Elijah is, is being referenced here, King Ahab is the king over the northern tribes, and, and he is a wicked, wicked dude in every single way. He married a non-Jewish woman who became the, the queen. Her name is Jezebel. She was a Baal worshiper in not only that, she made it the official religion of Israel. Well, Jezebel hears about what Elijah did. Elijah was not just a prophet. He was a warrior in the hands of God. And, and he, he executed God's judgment on 800 plus prophets. Jezebel goes after Elijah for this very reason. And she says, and I'm summarizing, when I get a hold of that guy, he's dead. So after Elijah's spectacular victory over the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, Jezebel's threats sent him fleeing for his life. I mean, there's a side note in that to behold also, isn't there? Here is a prophet who on his, on his own with the power of the Lord and, and walking in the graces of God was able to, to see God execute his judgment on 800 plus false prophets right in his midst and to see God vindicate his name and to show himself mighty and powerful. And this is not a statement on male-female relationships here, <laughs> but a female enters and he runs. <laughs> he's, he's more afraid of her and what she will do and the threats than those 800 plus. That's in the text. So after the spectacular victory Jezebel's threats send him running for his life. 
In the scene Paul is quoting from here, Elijah is, here's what's happening. He's hiding in a cave on Mount Horeb. He's tired. He's depleted. He's discouraged. And worse, he believed that the nation would now turn from its apostasy and worship, but, but the Lord didn't cause that to happen. Surely now, with the slaying of these prophets, surely now God's people will see their foolishness. No, they just harden their position even more. It's a very disheartening scene for Elijah. He's crying out to God. They had killed the prophets, demolished the altars. I'm the only one left. He complained, and they're trying to kill me. Verse four, but what is the divine response to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. This is Yahweh's response to Elijah in 1 Kings 19, verse 18. Elijah, you're not only wrong, you're 7,000 times wrong. You're really wrong. And there's so much going on there, right? One is, Elijah, you're just one man cowering in a cave. You can't possibly understand the perspective that God has on this. So, there, but there's Elijah. He's sulking in a cave. It, that cave, by the way, was 40 days and nights journey away from the danger. He's consumed with self-pity. I'm the only one. You ever feel like you're the only one? We all have. I'm the only one who's suffering. I'm the only one who's going through this. I'm the only one who's lost in this way. I'm the only one who's been ridiculed and laughed at. I'm the only one. I am all alone in this. You ever feel like that? That's a common experience. In that moment, Elijah learned that he was not a minority of one. He was not the last prophet in the land. If he had known the the whole story, he would have realized that God had preserved for himself a significant number of Israelites that had not fallen to the worship of Baal. Dale Ralph Davis, he he calls this, I love this, the stubbornness of the covenant-keeping God. I love that. Davis says, grace will have a remnant. God has decided to have a true people and he will have them and keep them and there is nothing any Jezebel can do about it. Elijah is like some of you right now, overwhelmed with his circumstances. The unbelief, the wickedness, it just seems too great. I was thinking about this even last week when we were in the the closing verses there of of chapter 10. You you preach at times, but no one listens. Some laugh, some ridicule, some turn their backs, some harden their hearts. It seems like you're all alone in a cave. No one wants to be in such a position, but 1 Kings shows us that even if you're a broken down servant like Elijah, Davis says again, we have a kind and adequate God. No matter where you are. Now why does Paul ease us back through this window of Old Testament history in the prophet of Elijah? He answers, verse five, in the same way then, it's making a parallel here, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. The defection of the faithful in Elijah's day did not invalidate God's plan and promises for his people. And Paul's saying the same is true today, even right now. When it seems that Israel has so hardened itself against the Messiah, Paul says, still, even now, God has a remnant that he is showering with his grace. I got to meet a few years ago a a pastor named Steve Kreloff, who has been a pastor for the last 45 years of the same church in Florida. Steve was born into a very strict Jewish family. He would ultimately come to know Jesus as his Messiah while a university freshman in Florida. He talks about how he had this Elijah complex, as he calls it, when God saved him. He says this, when I accepted the Lord, I thought I was the only Jewish person in the whole world who had ever become a Christian. 
The Gentile believers, I think this is hilarious, the Gentile believers I knew did little to correct my thinking. I was the first Hebrew Christian most of them had ever met, and they tended to place me on exhibit like a one-of-a-kind species. There have been many Jews in every generation that have come to see and know that Jesus is the promised Jewish Messiah. There was a, a Jewish church in Paul's day, right? Isn't this how the church begins? It's primarily at the very beginning there in Jerusalem in Acts 2. It is a Jewish church. Uh, the, the book, the first epistle that is written, at least chronologically in our New Testaments, is the book of James. Who, it's, who is James writing to? He's writing to the scattered tribes of Israel because of persecution and because of the diaspora. He is writing to the Jewish believers who are scattered throughout the land. Paul uses the word here in verse 5, remnant. And it's an unusual word, unusual in the sense this is the only time this word appears in the New Testament. It's used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, and when it's used there, it's, it's used as uh, synonymous with survivors. The remnant, they're survivors. How, how did we make it out of our unbelief? How did we survive God's grace? And then Paul says this present remnant is proof and guarantee of the nation's future preservation. Now notice real carefully there in verse five, I don't wanna miss this. God is saving a present remnant just like he has always done. For example, see Elijah, and this is what he will do in the future as well. How do we know that? If you look down at verse 26, it is written, all Israel will be saved. This is a big question. Does that mean every single person who's ever been in Israel? The short answer to that is no. We're gonna see why that's the case. But a large majority, an overwhelming majority of them will be saved in the future. But notice carefully, here's what I don't want you to miss in verse five. How has he saved them or anyone else? According to God's gracious choice. Literally, an election of grace. Not an election of God affirming your decision or your vote in his favor. Not an election of God looking down the tunnel of time and seeing what you and I might do and, and playing some kind of uh, inception mind time bending trick in which he sees what you're gonna do and then he goes back and makes that. No, it's an election of grace. He chose you for this very reason, to show grace. That's how salvation works. Why did God save anyone? It's, it's by grace. You, you know what grace means? Here, here's what it doesn't mean. It, it, it cancels out any understanding, any sense of our works, our merits, our features, our understanding contributing to our salvation. Grace cancels that out. It's either all of grace or it's not. How do we know that? Because that's exactly what Paul says in the very next verse. Verse six. If it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, you don't have grace. He says at the end of verse six, otherwise grace is no longer grace. Any understanding of grace that marries or mixes works with that is not grace. Salvation is by grace alone, in Christ alone, through faith that is alone. And even that faith, Paul says in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, is a gift of God. God's means of saving people now is also how he will save them in the future, always by sovereign grace. This is proof number two of how God is showing his love and his purposes not only for them, but how, how he has done that for you. He is saving a remnant. Number three, the third proof. What is God doing right now? He is also exposing their spiritual unbelief. He's expo exposing their spiritual unbelief. How can you explain unbelief in Israel? Well, there's a number of ways that you can't explain it. This was the whole ending of Romans 10 that we saw last week in very quick form. So, so what happened? He, he says in chapter 10, verse 10 and following, it's not, uh, you can't explain their unbelief this way, it's not that God's word has been withheld from them. That's not the case. They were the first to receive God's word. He says in, in, verse, in chapter 10, verse 18, it's not like God was without a witness in the world, even general revelation. They can see God's power in creation and every single person who's ever lived can see this in themselves too because they are created in the image of God. It's, it's not like God doesn't have a witness in that sense. That doesn't explain their unbelief. 
It's not, he says in chapter 10, verse 19, like they weren't warned of their own spiritual unbelief. And he goes back and he points forward from Moses, and then he says even Isaiah was even more bold and points out that. It's not like God has not been gracious. Is it because God doesn't want to save, or is that God is stingy with his grace? No. Chapter 10, verse 21, for as, but as for Israel, he says, all the day long, I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. God has been showing his grace and favor to a stubborn, unbelieving people. And so you ask, well, what then? That's what Paul says. Verse seven, what then? What, how, so how do we make sense of this? What Israel is seeking, it is not obtained, but those who were chosen obtained it, and the rest were hardened. It's very interesting. Hardened. This is a judicial hardening from the Lord. There's a sense, and we've seen this since Romans 9, where individuals, even unbelievers like Pharaoh, they, it says they hardened their own heart. And then in other passages, it says God hardened their heart. Well, well, what's the case? What's the resolution of that? The answer is yes. For a person who is naturally bent in their sin, and, and they are hardened in their sin, for God to harden them further is just to take his hands completely off and leave them to their own devices. And that's what happened. Judicially, and, and on the whole, that was what was taken place, and it has taken place to this very day in Israel. That's what he says there in verse seven. It's like being covered with a callus, he says. They are hardened. Uh, like a callus on the foot or on the hand, it, it makes you insensitive to things. You, you don't respond, and, and in some cases, you don't respond to, to pain. You don't respond to, to uh, the, the cues that your body is sending that, that I'm stepping on something that will kill me, potentially. And the same is happening here. Their, their hearts are callous. They are hardened, and they don't understand that they are trampling over the very grace of God. It's similar to our word for paralysis. It's no feeling. From our saved, mostly Gentile perspective, it's, this is so obvious, isn't it? I mean, if, especially you think of you who've been in the Lord for decades and, and you've read through the Bible and you've rehearsed the promises and you've taught them to your children and your grandchildren and you teach them here and Sunday school and, and, and you've been around the things of the Lord for a long time and it's just so obvious. And the older you get in Christ, the more the dots just connect in Scripture. Not in some weird way. You just see the wonderful continuity and consistency of Scripture and you think, how? how could anybody miss this if they're taking it seriously? I've had that thought. It's so obvious. I mean, can't you read Isaiah 53? It's right there. Have you not read? This is what Jesus says to the Jewish leadership. I mean, you have read what I read, right? He says. All day long, he said in 10, 21, I've stretched out my hands to what? To a disobedient and obstinate people. An obstinate people. It's not that the Jewish people wanted to come to faith, but God said no. He said back in chapter 10, verse 13, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. You know what that means? Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's what that means. So it's not like... God has just said, you know what, I know you're calling out, I know you want to be saved, but I'm going to choose to harden you anyway. That's, that's not what's happening here. Rather, Paul showed in Romans 10 that every possible avenue has been open to them, but they as a whole have rejected God's Messiah, Jesus. So he has left them in a temporary state of judicial hardening. It's temporary because look down at chapter 11, verse 25. Paul says right there, it's a partial hardening that has taken place right now until the timing of the Gentiles is complete. God is going to save many of them in time, but right now it's a general state of hardened unbelief. This answers that question that maybe you've wondered before. Why can't they see it? Because they're hardened Again, we have to balance that with what we just saw, and still, God's still saving people, a remnant out of that, even individuals like Paul. But it's not a mass revival of that. 
Now Paul goes back to the Old Testament again to show that the hardness of heart characterizing Israel was, was actually predicted. Verse 8, just as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not, ears to hear not, down to this very day. He's restating the truth here from Deuteronomy 29 verse 4. And and the point of Deuteronomy 29 is that in themselves they will never know and love God. And then the next chapter, Deuteronomy 30, says very plainly that a day will come when God will regather the nation of Israel from all the places where they are scattered back to the land and they will love God and obey him with all their heart. Now, how does that take place? It's a good question. Is it just because they're Israelites and God's because of that? Just very, no, he's gonna change their hearts. He's gonna give them a heart to believe. He says that, Deuteronomy 30, verse six. Yahweh your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love Yahweh your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. Until then, verse eight, here's the deal. This is what spiritual hardness looks like, not only in Israel, but in any unbeliever. Look what he says in verse eight, a spirit of stupor. This means they're easily influenced. When someone is inebriated, when they are under the influence, they are easily influenced by all sorts of other things, aren't they? Easily influenced. There's a numbness. There's a dullness. There's a I don't care attitude. It's, it's, a, it's a state of spiritual drunkenness that's being described here. Not only that, they're lacking discernment. Eyes to see not. They see and read the same things that you do, but they do not understand it. There is no discernment. There's no discernment to know that this is truth and this is not. There's a spiritual deafness, ears to hear not, down to this very day. They hear the same messages, they hear the same truth, but they don't believe. What's the result of this? Notice verses nine and 10. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened to see not and bend their backs forever. Strong words, right? Now, this is important. Who is Paul quoting here? He's quoting David from Psalm 69, verse 22. This, I want to be very clear, this is not some anti-Semitic statement that Paul has cooked up. This is from the lips of the Jewish king, David, from the city of David, amongst the people of David, recipient of the Davidic covenant. You understand? And even David in his day, a thousand years before Christ, he recognized that Israel's table of blessing had become a snare for them. What God had provided for them as a form of blessing and showing his love and his favor, they have taken a provision and they have tried to use it to get to heaven and they can't. Paul's making a very important point here that that should not be missed. Israel's spiritual hardness did not begin with Jesus, but it followed them all throughout their history even a thousand years before Paul writes this. This is David. Their history has been rebellion after rebellion after rebellion. There's so many examples of this. Um, Isaiah 6, verse 8. After uh, Isaiah sees the Messiah in his temple, what does he say? I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, Lord, send me. Go and tell this people, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. And Isaiah, here's your mission. This is very disheartening for a preacher. Render the hearts of this people insensitive. Their ears dull, their eyes dim. Otherwise, they might not, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and return and be healed. Go and preach judgment and and confirm them in that. John says in a commentary on John, in John chapter 12, verse 37 about Jesus, he says, but though he had performed, Jesus had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah, the prophet which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason, they could not believe. And Isaiah says, he has blinded their eyes, hardened their hearts, and he's quoting there from Isaiah 6. 
Jesus says in Matthew 23, he looks over the city, he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets, stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather you, your children together, the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. You would not believe. John 1.11 says, he came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. Now let me make one more last comment here on what's happening in verses 9 and 10 because we're going to come back to this throughout chapter 11. For 2,000 years now, listen very carefully. For 2,000 years, the Jewish people have been persecuted. They have been murdered. They have been run out of country after country after country. And sometimes, in fact, too often, it's been at the behest of people who name the name of Christ. There's an aspect of anti-Semitism that has always been. It was there in the Old Testament. It was there in the New Testament. It's been all throughout history. Yea, verily, it's in the headlines the last couple of weeks with Kanye, of all people. It's, it's just always there. And sometimes, some have looked at this statement of judgment in verses 9 and 10 from the lips of David and they have wrongly interpreted it as a command. Meaning, according to some, Israel rejected the Messiah, so then let them get whatever comes to them. Don't believe me? It's a sad story. We could, we could compound examples from the Reformation and even long before that, Chrysostom on this word for snare here, he says, this means let their comforts and all their good things change and perish and let them be open to attack from all sides. The philosophical and cultural arguments against the Jews did, did not begin in the 20th century with Hitler and Nazi Germany. It actually has a long history even in certain Christian circles. Thomas Aquinas who for some reason is seeing a rebirth today, even amongst evangelicals. He said, the sin of the Jews has resulted in their consignment to perpetual servitude and Christendom. And then those statements were picked up by unbelievers, and it's just been repeated again and again. Uh, Frederick Nietzsche, no friend of the Christian faith, he says, the, talking about the Jews, the extinction of many types of people is just as desirable as any form of, rep of reproduction. The composer, Richard Wagner, he says, I regard the Jewish race as the born enemy of pure humanity and everything that is noble in it. Grimm's fairy tales, I'm not gonna leave the kids alone here. There's even a story in that called The Jew in the Bush where the main character is a cheating, thieving Jew who winds up on the gallows. Karl Marx, who also is seeing a rebirth today, he wrote an entire book called On the Jewish Question. Out of its entrails, bourgeois society continually creates Jews. Emancipation from their huckstering and from money and consequently from practical, real Judaism would be the self-emancipation of our era. If we could just get rid of them, we'll be fine, he says. That's Marx. For 2,000 years, they've been called Christ killers. They've been persecuted. They've been harassed. The differences between biblical Christianity and Judaism should in no way foster any form of hatred or anti-Semitism. James writes to the church and the tribes that are scattered, he says, none of us are to hold our faith in our glorious Lord with a sense of personal favoritism. That should eradicate any such thing. God has a divine purpose in this. Verse 11, we're gonna explore this next week. God is using their sin to reach Gentiles. We'll come back to that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Again, it is wonderful and searching and powerful. And so we pray with Paul and we exclaim with him, oh, the depths and the riches both of your wisdom and your knowledge how unsearchable are your judgments. How unfathomable are your ways. Who of us could be your counselor? Who of us could tell you to do it another way? Who has given to you that it could be paid back? Lord, you are 
before all things and in all things and all things are from your hand. And so, Lord, we pray that we would see this wonder, wonderful promise of your grace even to the Jewish people and how that's already been seen. That, Lord, that you would show your grace even now to the hearts of those who do not know you. Those who came in here with hard hearts, we pray that you would soften them. We pray that you would turn them from their wicked ways. You pray that you would grant repentance and faith. We pray that you would open their eyes to behold your, your son, Jesus Christ. And we pray that as a church, we would be bold, that we would not hold our faith with personal favoritism, that we would be loving to the lost, that we would be kind and gracious, that we would be wise to the times in which we live in and yet faithful with your word. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. As we celebrate the grace of God and in, in the salvation of individuals, it's fitting that we have the, the opportunity to recognize new members this morning to Grace Community Church. Uh, church membership is, a, is, is just a wonderful expression of love and commitment and accountability between a Christian and the local church. And so uh, the new members that are, that are coming today, they, they desire to unite with us. They profess the gospel of Jesus Christ. They have expressed repentance from their sins. They have identified with Christ in baptism. They, they love the Lord and they love his word and they, they love his church and so they desire to uh, commit themselves uh, to loving and serving this church. And at the same time, we as a church are making a, a commitment to them to, to love them and serve them and shepherd them uh, according to the word of God, to, to come alongside them and walk with them uh, through good times and bad, and to, uh, to love them as brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, so this morning we are recognizing nine individuals, so uh, when I call your name you can come down front. Ben and Evelyn Beecham, Chase and Grace Bender, Corey and Tatum Burke, Kyle and Devin Knotts, and Addie Smith. I'm going to read through our uh, church covenant now, which these individuals have agreed to pursue. This, is, this covenant is, is a summary of, uh, of biblical teaching on, on how church members ought to uh, live life together. And so I encourage everyone here, all the members of the church, to listen carefully, to be reminded of these things, and to uh, just be encouraged to pursue these things all the more. Having had my justification procured by the grace of God, upon a submission to the infinite value and supreme lordship of Jesus Christ, I, through the enablement of the Spirit of God, commit to pursue spiritual devotion by participating in corporate worship services, participating in the music and the instruction of the word with physical and spiritual attentiveness, by pursuing holiness, applying the principles of scripture thoughtfully, avoiding temptation deliberately and confessing sin continually, by receiving correction from others, desiring to bring all my actions into conformity to the will of God. And I commit to pursue meaningful relationships by cultivating a loving community, bearing others' burdens, intensifying others' joy, and living openly with the members of Christ's body, by restoring wayward saints, praying for them unceasingly, pursuing their restoration immediately and engaging them tenderly by encouraging the saints, avoiding gossip and ungracious speech, being loving in judgments and conclusions of others, preserving peace by submitting to others insofar as they submit to Christ, being slow to be offended, quick to forgive, and refusing to be embittered, always pursuing reconciliation. And I commit to pursue sacrificial service by volunteering and employing gifts and talents regularly, being willing always to be inconvenienced to fulfill any task, by giving liberally, not grudgingly, to support the expenses of the church, remembering Christ is honored by a joyful giver, by assessing the instruction of the church according to the scriptures, knowing that the preservation of doctrinal purity is a corporate responsibility. And I commit to pursue intentional missions by instilling hope 
to those emo emotionally downcast, listening, sympathizing, and sharing the hurts of others, by ministering the gospel to those spiritually impoverished, seeking the redemption of all people with no partiality, by meeting material needs to those physically destitute, providing selfless, generous assistance when able. Amen. Let's pray for these individuals. Father, we thank you once again for this church and for uh, just the wonderful blessing that it is. It is uh, such a joy to see you build your church, to see you save souls and to sanctify them and to conform them to the image of your son. Lord, we have a, a front row seat to just the magnificent power of your grace. And so I, I pray that we would never lose uh, the awe that we ought to have as we behold your gracious work in the world. I thank you for these new members who have come to unite with this church. We thank you for their faith and the evidence of your transforming grace in their lives. We pray that, that you would strengthen them, that they would hold fast to their confession, that they would uh, use their gifts and abilities to strengthen this church, to edify the church, and ultimately to bring glory to your name. Help them, Lord, to love and serve others, to speak truth, to be gracious and forgiving and patient, and to interact with an attitude of humility and kindness at all times. And we pray that this church would be faithful to them as well. Help us to faithfully shepherd them, to disciple them according to your word. May we love them well, encouraging them in their faith and walking with them through times of joy and through times of grief. Help us likewise to always love them with an attitude of humility and kindness. Lord, we thank you that Christ has made all of this possible. His blood has paid the penalty for our sins. We have been forgiven an infinite debt. So we pray that we would remember that and that we would be faithful, obedient worshipers, always bringing glory to your name. In your name we pray. Amen. I welcome you to encourage these new members as you, as you have an opportunity. Uh, get to know them and encourage them in their, in their walk with Christ. Thank you, guys. You can, you can be seated. What a sweet time together. Amen. I've got a, a, rhyme, a reminder and then a couple of updates before we dismiss with the benediction. A reminder is on Sunday, December 11th, we will have our baptism class. This class is for anyone interested in being baptized. The class will tell you what we teach and how we practice this ordinance. Um, if you have any questions about that, you can go to the desk in the foyer there. And then just a couple of updates. One is the waters left for Chad Africa yesterday, and they're still traveling. And just please continue to pray for them and their travels, that they would get there safely, get there healthy, so they can encourage the Myers, the, our missionary family in Chad there as well as they possibly can. And then I also want to update you on um, my daughter, Olivia. She is home with us. Thank you all for your prayers. Thank you so much for your generosity and the meals. And it's just, it was a difficult season and it was, it was uh, far more bearable with you all coming alongside our family. So just thank you for the prayer and you can continue to pray for the transition as she's home and she's eating and she's sleeping, praise the Lord. Yes, it's fantastic, and she's beautiful, of course. Um, so with that, let's uh, stand together, and we'll close with the benediction. We'll say it all together. It comes from Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity in whose spirit there is no deceit. Amen. You're dismissed.